Hey everyone, this is Coach Chris, and this is my Stridecast, my fourth Stridecast. Um, today we're going to be covering the Power Center. Now, there's been a lot of confusion out there about how to use Power uh, Power Center, which is Stride's workout platform, where when you finish a run and you upload it to Garmin Connect, it automatically pushes your data to the Stride Power Center, and that way you can analyze it, you can look at trends, and you can use it to improve your overall fitness and really get into the data. But there's been a lot of confusion about there how to best use the data and what data is there and what it actually means. So in this Stridecast, I wanna make sure that you come away with a better understanding of how to use Power Center, what those numbers actually mean, and how to improve your performance as a runner. So let's dive into it. All right, everyone. So what we're going to be doing here is we're actually going to be working backwards. So instead of starting with analyze, improve, compete, I'm going to be actually starting with settings. And the reason why I'm doing this is because the information that we input into settings will impact, compete, improve, and analyze. And it's important to set this settings up before you do anything else with your stride unit and with your runs. So how do you set this up? Well, first off, your profile settings. Here, if you signed in with Google, it will automatically import your picture with Google. I signed in with Google, so that's my Google picture with my wife and my dog. You can write yourself a little blurb here. Um, birth date, height, and weight. We're gonna get back to weight because it is an important metric to put in and there's a little confusion there about um, what and how often you should update that. Um, your location, of course, gender, and then another important thing to focus on is your target race distance. And so you can choose here from 5K all the way up to marathon. Unfortunately, you can't choose ultra quite yet. Um, if you are an ultra runner, choose the marathon program. But that choosing marathon or 5K or 10K or whatever your target race is will impact the improve tab. So you, it's important to do that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about weight before we move on. It's important to insert your weight um, because it will give you a good power to weight ratio and it will, um, it will help with that metric. But let's say you should not update it daily. I would not update it daily. Your weight fluctuates not only from day to day but throughout the course of the day. So let's say you wake up, you're a little dehydrated and you go for a run. You're gonna be a little bit lower than your normal weight. Then if you run in the afternoon after you've drunk in a bunch of water and you had lunch and you had your afternoon snack or a protein bar right before you ran, it's going to change. I like to just choose an average. Now, if that overall trend drops, let's say I hit the weight room and I put on a bunch of muscles, so I go from 150 on average to 155 on average, then once I start to see consistently that 155 pop up on my bathroom scale, then I will go ahead and change it. But if you're fluctuating a couple pounds from day to day, or you're running with a hydration pack on, I would not change that number. If you, every single time you run with a weighted vest or a hydration pack, then go ahead and change it um, to like 151 or 152. But if it's not something you're consistently doing, leave it, let it be. So that's that's the set, uh, that's the first part of the settings. Connect. Um, you can import from Garmin to Sunto. I'm a Garmin person, so I automatically import from Garmin, meaning I finish a run, I upload to Garmin Connect, and Garmin Connect automatically pushes to Stride Running. Then exports to uh, Stride Power Center. Exports to, I only selected Strava, even though I've got a Training Peaks account. If I connected my Training Peaks account with Power Center, I would double up my runs because it automatically my Training Peaks account syncs with Garmin already. So if I connected Power Center to, excuse me, I've got to turn off my phone. If I connected Power Center to Training Peaks, I would have two runs um, because it doesn't recognize that they're the same run. So if you do use Training Peaks or Two Peaks, um, pick one place to export to, um, but don't double up. And if you are doubling up, this could be the reason why. I do uh, export to Strava because Training Peaks and Strava don't really communicate too well for me, so I find it easier for Power Center to export to Strava. One note about Strava is that they are not accepting power meter data. You have to use a separate app um, called, I think it's Travisti, um, which will analyze the power data, but Strava does not recognize your power numbers. Uh, that's a feature that they're hopefully going to implement or bring back in the next couple months. But for now, 
if you want power analysis on Strava's platform, don't uh, you're not going to get it. Zones. Now, zones is very important to set up. Now, here's what I recommend. I recommend that you do a critical power test, and we're going to talk about different types you can use. Critical power test once you get your stride. But here's the kicker. Do not change your running program after you've done that first critical power test. Set it up with a critical power number and then just observe the numbers in that first month of training. Observe, you know, go out for an easy run, but in saying I, I'm gonna hold this wattage for this easy run, instead of doing that, what I would do is I would just say, you know, this is the average power number that I hold on my easy runs. Just observe, play around with it, experiment what happens with your power numbers over time in that course of the, the introductory phase in that first month, but don't modify your running training program Based off the number, uh, based off the numbers, wait until you've adapted, you've gotten used to running, and also you've become more familiar with training with power because it is different, and you need to be aware of that. So the different critical power tests you can do, you can do a three-six lap test on a track where you do a twelve hundred meter, and then you take a thirty minute rest um, or active recovery, and then you do a twenty four hundred meter um, uh, run on the track. You can do a three nine minute test if you don't have access to a track. You can do a 5K estimation and a 10K estimation. I found that all of these are fairly valid. I did a 10K race and then a three six test on the track and my power numbers were three watts off. So both are, any test you choose is going to be fairly valid. Just make sure that you're consistent in the testing that you do. That's the important part. Consistency is key. I went with the 10K estimation and hit the calculate button and it gave me this critical power number and my critical pace. Now this critical power number is theoretically what I could hold for an hour. So if I ran nonstop all out for an hour, I would be able to hold 330 watts. And that breaks down into specific zones. So Power Center uses five zones specifically. Different coaches have different zones, and that's important to denote. So if you see, if you read an article that says, oh, most of your runs should be in zone one versus zone two, um, or zone two versus zone one, or you should avoid zone three, it doesn't necessarily refer to the same percentages of your critical power. So Power Center breaks it down, and easy, easy right here, if I was to compare this to a Joe Friel uh, program easy is what Joe Friel or Matt Fitzgerald would call um, zone ones and zone two. That's your easy for power, your easy zone for power center. And the reason why I say that aligns with what Matt Fitzgerald and Joe Friel call uh, and a couple other coaches zone one and zone two is because it's sixty five percent to eighty percent of your critical power. Moderate refers to 81% to 90% of your critical power. Threshold refers to 91% to 100%. Intervals 101 to 115%. And rep, uh, repetition refers to 115 all the way up to, and I think they go up to 125%, but it can go beyond. How does this look like compared to other coaches? So as I said, easy pace refers more to what people typically refer to zone one and zone two. Moderate, I would say, refers to low threshold pace or low zone three, so 3A. Threshold refers to my high threshold pace or 3B. Interval, I would say, is more zone four. And repetition is zone five. So if you go to any other calculators, that's what I have found line up, but it once again, it varies from coaches to coaches. Now, this easy pace, right here, uh, the, the pace correlation I find also works. You know, most of my zone ones and zone two runs are in this pace range, um, but it does vary from the day and from athletes. And the reason why that is so big right there, that nine minutes to 717, is because it's such a big zone. And it also depends on how you're feeling that day. Um, I also found that these pace these paces line up very well with the Jack da uh, with Jack Daniels running calculator, um, but that I just found works for my numbers. It might not work for your numbers. So it's important to set these zones up because that's going to impact your other tabs. Finally, training plans. If you want to import a 
training with power plan from the stride center i think they have a couple depending on what you're focusing on and your time constraints you can import it and they will drop it into your calendar and it will give you a training plan they're hoping to expand that i'm not sure if they have quite yet but they're hoping to expand it um, but you can also get training plans from matt fitzgerald with power and i think jim vance is launching that fortunately you can't implement um, import those from other third-party platforms you can only choose strides plans currently that might change we'll see I want to briefly touch on the compete tab because I find it I find it humorous um, because if you mess up your settings or you fudge the numbers in settings everything here is going to be fudged as well and the reason why I say that is this is a great example right here this person has a critical watts per kilogram of 101.5 that is one fast runner, if it's true. Uh, I highly doubt that. Uh, I also highly doubt that this person is pulling 100, uh, 974.9 running stress scores um, it, each day. Um, I also highly doubt this person is doing 2,603 RSS per week. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I find it humorous and get a chuckle, but I rarely click on this tab. Um, it is interesting to see where you line up, but where the people who put in their data accurately versus the people who fudge their data is highly variable. It's similar like Zwift, um, where you will get insane numbers. So don't, don't beat yourself up if you're not in the top 10, nor should you strive for the top 10, because that would be insane. Anywho, going to improve, and this is the most confusing tab, so I definitely want to spend quite a bit of time here going over the different charts here uh, and how you can use them or not use them in your running. So let's look at your stride runner profile first. This golden triangle right here, it's got three branches. You've got your metabolic fitness, you've got your muscle power, and you've got your muscle endurance. Metabolic fitness refers, is pretty much based off your critical power. Now when I scroll over here and it's at 89%, what that 89% means is that I'm in the 89th percentile of those who use stride and of those who chose the marathon and uh, the marathon program so it's comparing me to other runners in the marathon program it's not comparing me to the golden standard uh, or the, the uh, other people not using stride it's not comparing me to people in the 5k program or the 5k focus or the 10k focus it's strictly comparing me to based off my critical power to other runners in the stride pool of runners focusing on the marathon so that's very important to keep in mind because if more people join the stride platform and join the marathon program, that number is going to change. That 89% is going to change depending on who's in the pool and the type of numbers they're putting out. Muscle power refers to your 10 second sprint, uh, 10 second sprints. So your 10 second um, power output or your, your greatest output for uh, um, 10 seconds of sprinting. So if you're doing a lot of sprinting work, then your muscle power is going to be higher. If you're just doing mapitone training um, and you're just in that easy pace or that conversation pace, then your number is not going to be that great because your highest 10 second average isn't going to be that high. Once again, this is comparing you to other runners in this pool who are also marathon focused and using stride. So right here, I'm in the 49th percentile. So I'm, I'm, I'm average for my muscular power. Muscular endurance is calculated based off the highest stress from one, your, the most amount of stress from one of your runs. So let's say that's typically for the long run. So if your long run accumulates the most stress of your week, that's how your muscle endurance is calculated. Once again, it's comparing you to everyone else in the marathon focus stride pool. So here I'm in the 57th percentile. Now, depending on which leg is your weakest leg will determine your training optimizer. So because muscular power is my weakest leg, my muscular power over here is orange. And it's suggesting that if I want to improve muscular power, I should do VO2 max intervals, hill, uh, hill repeats, and supplemental training, and that's like plyometrics in the gym. That's if I want to improve. I am focused more on endurance events, so do I really care if I can hit 600 watts for 10 seconds? Not really. I'm not gonna change up my training program just so that I can get, just so I can address, make this 49th percentile to 50, uh, to 60 percentile. 
I'm not going to change up my training to do that. So take it with a grain of salt, find it interesting, and if you do want to improve your muscular power, then by all means you can change up your training, but I would stick with your own training program. Now if you're like 1% here, that means you're in the 1% of your muscular power, and you're an ultra runner, it just depends on your time. If you're a 5K runner and you're in the 1%, then you might need to address muscular power. But you should not change up your training based off of what percentile you're in, or what this states. I think all training programs should have should hit all of these different zones and should incorporate over the course of a season these all of these different types of runs. But should you drop your program based off this chart? No. So let's identify your trends. Now, this is all of the runs that you have done on Stride, and there's no way to calculate and there's no way to change it to a time frame. So I was doing a lot of triathlon training in here, so not as many runs, but my runs were pretty intense. And then I took a break, and then I got back into running at the beginning of June, and you can see my trend increase. Now a couple things to think about here, I'm actually gonna flip over to metabolic fitness. All right, uh, here we are. One second, there we are. So one thing to note is regardless of whether you're an elite two hour marathoner or whether you're an eight minute marathoner or um, or eight hour marathoner you're all going everyone's going to start at zero and that's just because you have not accumulated enough runs for them to really calculate the data so you really do need a wide range of runs a lot of runs in the program for them to start calculating trends and you also need to be consistent in that if you scroll over to one of the dots on the trends, it gives you a number, so 54 trend. And if you go to the Stride blog, you will find that um, these numbers, these trend numbers, correspond with distances. So 54, I believe, says that I'm ready for a marathon. Well, that might be true, but that also is based, as I said before, on how many runs you've accumulated. You could have come into using Stride ready for a marathon. It, the program, because you don't have enough runs underneath your belt, hasn't caught up with this. Now, when should you actually use something like this? Is if you're a 5K runner with a lot of runs and you're focusing on a marathon and your trends are somewhere between 14 and 21, then it might be good to you know obey the chart and say, you know, I might not be ready for a marathon. That's where I would use this. But it's interesting to look at the trends. It's interesting to look at your, interesting to look at how your training progressed. But it's not something, as I said before with the other charts, you should change up your data because of it. Or you shouldn't run a marathon because you're at 57 versus 64. Same could be said with muscular endurance. And once again, this is the, uh, this, the muscular endurance is your highest loads. Here it's cool because you can see, you can, pr uh, you can look at trends and make sure that you're not adding too much load every single week. So if I saw a really big spike from one week to another, like right here, it might show, it might give you a couple red flags of saying, oh, you know, you went a little bit too hard in that long run and you should really tone it back. So. It helps you, a lot of people say, you know, the 10% rule, you shouldn't add on uh, more than 10% per uh, per week. This right here is you shouldn't add on too much in a singular run, and you're able to look at that trend. Muscular power, you can see that 10 second speed is improving. So if you are really working on plyometrics and hill sprints, you can actually see that. So I started doing hills in the middle of uh, middle of July, and you can see that my 10 second sprints, uh, 10 sp second sprint power has gone up. So you can see how different changes in your running program influences these three different branches of running development. Finally, let's go on to two other graphs that are slightly confusing. Let's take this one, the marathon plan comparison. What Stride did here is they looked at a bunch of different marathon programs. So from Jim Vance, Joe Friel, I'm sure they did Matt Fitzgerald in there. I'm sure they did Jack Daniels. So they looked at all of those training programs and all of those training plans, those generic plans you can buy offline. And they looked at them and they said 71% on average of the runs in these training plans were based off of, um, were based uh, or had you running in zone one. 
and then 20% in zone two, and then 4% in zone three, all the way up to zone five. And then that you can track how your runs compare to the runs in those marathon training programs. Here's the problem though. These are all of your runs. You cannot set a specific time frame to see what percentage of your runs. So if you're focusing on a 10K, and then you, uh, if you are focusing on more speed work, uh, where you're in the zone four and zone five, but then suddenly go to working on longer distances, and if you just stick in that marathon focus plan, it's looking at all of your runs. It's not looking at a specific training phase. So keep that with a grain of salt. Also, because this is based off the zones that we talked about in the settings, it's important to realize you can't set up individual buckets. So my zone two, how I calculate my zone two is slightly different from stride. So I actually prefer looking at my percentages at, in training peaks versus this, just because I'm able to customize my zones. So that's important to take in mind. Should you train, change up your training load based off these, uh, what you see here? Absolutely not. It's just very interesting to look at it. The only time I would change my training is if all of my runs were in zone three or all of my runs, runs were in zone one, then I would reassess my training. Now let's go on to the power curve and the heat map. And I wanna make this very clear because it's important to keep this in mind. These are two separate graphs overlaid onto one graph. So I'm going to treat them as two separate graphs and hopefully that will alleviate some confusion. So let's look at the power curve first. And the power curve refers to this. So disregard all the, the beautiful little colors, and let's focus just on the power curve. Now the power curve gives you your best critical, your best all out effort power at specific times. So let's say, and this is helpful when we're talking about setting up a race plan. So let's say I wanna do an 80 minute, an hour 20 half marathon. So what I do to go along the power curve, and if I wanna do 80 minutes for, there we are, if I wanna do 80 minutes for my um, for my half marathon, I would need, according to this, to hold out 280 watts. Well, uh, so if I would go and set, I would set power race to 280 watts and I would run it and that would get me 80 minutes. That's what I can hold max effort for 80 minutes. So that's the curve power, my 280 watts. My real power is what I've actually done in my run. So I've actually run two of my runs, that's my run number, two of my runs at 300 watts for 80 minutes. So that's the power curve right there. And this power curve will change depending on your focuses. So I've noticed that most endurance runners will have a flatter curve. So you can see that this is rather flat. I'm gonna post a, um, I'm gonna give you a picture of someone who's more of a sprinter over here, uh, a picture over here to show you what a sprinters look like because it is a steeper curve. That relates to this heat map. And the heat map just tells you all of your runs, not your current training phase, out of all of your runs, where you spend most of your time. So most of my time is spent between 250, so right around 270 watts um, in this longer range. It is, important to know, uh, it is important to know that you see all these little gray dots over here and then you see a couple here. I don't do a lot of 120 minute runs. I don't do a lot of 170 minute runs. I do a couple and those are what show up. If you are a long distance runner, of course you want those numbers to show up. Um, but as far as the power curve goes, it tracks all of your runs regardless of what phase of training you are in. Um, just whenever you started using stride, it's on this heat map. Uh, it is interesting to note where you spend most of your time. Endurance runners, I can bet, will have more of a, uh, a map like mine versus a sprinter, as you'll see in the bottom corner, um, have a very wide range and they vary their paces and power outputs. So I hope that clears up some confusion with those two graphs. Finally, managing training loads. Uh, hopefully it will, let's see here, you can change this, you can actually change the calendar output and it, let's say I want to monitor stress to make sure that I'm not overdoing or um, not, I'm progressing too quickly with my stress um, and I can monitor it by week. Once again, it's important that you set up your critical power because if you, 
if you lowball your critical power, that means your RSS will jump, and that's you can see that right here where my June 19th 436 RSS, my power numbers weren't set correctly, so that messed up my RSS numbers, and you can't retroactively calculate stress right now. You cannot say, oh, that, that was a mistake because my power was really this. You can't change that right now. It's in the books and you can't change it. So it's important to test, I would say, every six to eight weeks to make sure that your power number is correct so that your RSS is correct, your running stress score is correct. You can also break this down by distance and time and zones. So that's it for the improve tab. Let's dive into the analyze tab, the final tab here. Uh, this is going to be fairly easy. Uh, so what it does is it pops up your most recent run. Over here you have a calendar. If you ran that day, you will see a white dot. If you didn't run that day, you will see a uh, smaller white dot. Uh, so you can track what you're doing. Unfortunately, if you click on one of these numbers, it won't take you to that date. You have to go down to the bottom calendar. Um, but hopefully in the future, Stride will allow you to click on one of these dots and it will take you to that run or that day. Average power, pace, time, distance, etc. You can tag your workouts as easy runs all the way up to cruise intervals or thresholds. I like to label them, I like to tag them, and then of course give you RPE for when you're looking back or you're compar comparing two runs. You can say, you know, this run was really hard two months ago, but this date it was, uh, um, but today it felt easy. So you can compare runs um, and it's in. It's, it's important to keep a good training log, um, whether you do this or on training peaks, but it's interesting to keep, to look at that RPE and honestly assess, you know, was I pushing it too hard? Now let's focus on RSS, running stress score, and how that differs from training stress score. If you look at the formulas for RSS and TSS, they're fairly similar, except for one difference with RSS. RSS, you'll see, the intensity factor, so if they put your normalized power for the run over your critical power, they put that to the power of a K. They put it to the power of K, and that K is a constant. And what that allows the running stress score to do is say that running is harder and puts more stress on your body than cycling. So if I ran for 60 minutes at an all-out effort, that means my or my body will go under a lot of more stress than if I go out on my bike and hold my FTP for an hour. And by pu putting that intensity factor to the power of K, it includes that in the RSS score. So running stress score I find is more accurate than training stress score and monitoring your RSS score is more accurate than following uh, TSS scores because it takes into account the stressful nature of running. So it's important to track that when we're dealing with monitoring injury and progressive load. Of course, here, when we're getting to analysis, you can click on these different bubbles and it'll give you more statistics. So just going down the line, you can get your max power and then your leg spring stiffness. This is how stiff your legs are. So if you imagine a spring, if you have a stiff, oh, excuse me, if you have a stiff spring and you, um, it, it's, a more, it's more economic than if you have a loose spring. So monitoring your spring stiffness is a measure of running economy. Once again, it's important not to compare yourself to other people because people with different heights and weights and builds will have different leg spring stiffness. So if you look at Lionel Sanders, Ironman Arizona from last year, his uh, leg spring stiffness was, I think, started in the 12s, then went down to 11s, and I think he finishes in the high 9s. That's unique to him, so it's important not to compare yourself to me or other runners um, based off your leg spring stiffness. It is important to compare yourself to where you were five months ago as far as leg spring stiffness, because hopefully with more running and hopefully you're including plyometrics and mobility work, that running economy will improve and so will your leg spring stiffness. Form power is your running in place power. Average heart rate if you still train with heart rate, um, which I like to find for interesting comparison. You've got your cadence here and then of course your ground contact time and vertical oscillation. Um, it doesn't exactly align with the training peaks metrics I find that these two because training peaks also does something similar but they're fairly close. They're fairly close. Um, one thing that you can do here, I'm going to close this up, is you can change this to compare different metrics. So if I looked at heart rate versus power, 
So I'm going to click the bubble for heart rate. Come on. Actually, one, two, four, nine. Doesn't seem, but you can comp Oh, there we are. Nope. Let's get heart rate back. There we are. So if I looked at my heart rate, and this is, I, I did a video a couple weeks back on aerobic decoupling. You can see aerobic decoupling if these lines don't become parallel, but for this easy runs, yeah, my heart rate pretty much stayed parallel to my power output, which is a good sign, but you can do different comparisons. Um, you can also, if you wanted to do, let's see, uh, leg spring stiffness to power. You can see that my leg spring stiffness at the end was right around 10.12 versus the beginning, which was 10. So I was not fatiguing or I wasn't, my running economy wasn't changing over the course of this easy run. If that started to decline drastically, then I would, it would show that I'm not, uh, I'm losing running economy over the course of the run. Here for, la oh, one last thing you can do here is you can compare runs. So let's say I did this course again, two months from now, I can click back onto today's range and compare this run to a future run to see how I've improved. Finally, laps, I can change this to, from splits to miles. So let's say I, I, have, I had auto lap set up, so every single lap was um, recorded by my miles. But let's say I was doing 30 second sprints in here. If I clicked on the splits button, it would allow me to see just the 30 second sprints, uh, splits and break it down by split rather than just each individual mile. And finally here you can see your calendar. Also uh, it's color coded so you can see the ones in red are more intense runs versus the ones in greens which are your easy recovery runs. So that pretty much takes, oh, one last point on here. Your heat map here is also color coded. So you can see that, you can see that over here where I, it was rather hilly, my power numbers were in the red zone versus here, which was relatively flat, which is in the green zone. So that's interesting to note to see uh, where your spikes in power are and how that relates to the course in geographics. Anyway, that concludes this stridecast. If you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the comment section below, or you can head over to my website, braveheartcanada.com, and I will be happy to reach out with you, spend some time to see how you can impl implement running with power into your running so that you can tackle some PRs. Um, definitely subscribe, please, and hit the like button. Um, that helps me out a ton. And I've got a bunch of videos still um, to develop um, that are coming out in the next couple weeks uh, that, will, uh, that you definitely wanna uh, pay attention to. So make sure you hit the subscribe, make sure you hit the like, and I will see you.